ओके सो आई एम प्रहर्ष आई एम फ्रॉम आई सर भोपाल आई एम करेंटली परसुइंग माई मास्टर्स थीसिस आई मीन माई फिफ्थ ईयर एंड आई एम इंटरेस्टेड इन कॉजल इन्फ्लुंस एज अ टॉपिक एंड आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट आई एम गोइंग टू टॉक अबाउट कॉजल डिस्कवरी एंड नेटवर्क साइंस सो लेट्स गेट स्टार्टेड सो हाउ मेनी ऑफ यू नो वॉट कॉजैलिटी और कॉजल इन्फ्लुंस इज डू यू हैव एनी गेसेज what can it be let's keep this an interactive session yeah meer maybe the effect that we call the right so when you have let's say some data right you do something something happens but do you know that it's occurring because of that thing you're often not sure about that right so whenever we look at various models we look at uh, features that have high correlation right two things occurring together for example if i walk out into the garden and i have two features recorded suppose it's raining and my umbrella is open now when we look at correlation we can see that these two are occurring together but we don't know which is happening because of which by only looking at the data since we are all humans we have our own perceptions right so we know that since it's raining we are opening our umbrellas right so basically uh, looking for such causes in our models can often help us in deciphering whether uh, it's whether this correlation actually makes sense or not so yeah so let's get uh, started so what is causal inference basically it is the process of inferring the effects of any treatment policy intervention etc right so if i have a set of patients i i want to see what, uh, how a me, how a medicine affects uh, a patient right i want to see if it's helpful and if it should be launched into the market or not so the effect of a treatment on a disease basically right the effect of climate change policies on emissions right what kind of a policy do we want to give to the market or to the government so that they can make changes so that our emissions go down and the effect of social media on mental health these are like some vital uh, examples why is this tough to achieve because when i want to look at the cause right ideally i would want a situation where i have like a clone suppose i have a patient right ideally what would i want that i want all the other features to remain exactly the same and i want a patient's clone to be there so i give one of these two guys the medicine and the other remains untreated the exact difference between these two models is what the cause would be right because we are keeping enough invariant features among them but we are changing only one thing in between so this actually called difference in difference right but this is of course very tough to achieve because creating a clone is not actually possible so unless so if you have real world data you really won't have this counterfactual scenario possible at all so this is called the fundamental problem of causal inference that we don't have access to what would have happened instead of what we see right so inferring causal effects from data is often difficult so let's look at a situation okay we have condition and treatment right and if you look at the two, two treatments we have a and b and conditions can be mild severe and then there is a total column so if you look at this data right how many of you think that treatment a would be a better one than b uh raise of hands so if you look at the total column right a seems to be better <coughs> okay we'll get to that but if you look if you suppose you don't have access to the mild and severe uh columns right if you have only the percentages you would look at the total column and you would say that oh a is fine because it has a lower mortality rate right so i i'll actually give an example let let treatment a and b be two different medicines let's say right and if you look at the total column it says that 240 people out of the 1500 who were given this medicine died and uh, the 9 b says that 19% of the people died right 
so you guys know that there's a sampling imbalance and all that but we'll go to that later but if you only look at the percentages you would feel that treatment a is better right now if i give you the mild and severe conditions once you look at these subgroups you would see that oh okay when <coughs> when the condition is mild then the mortality rate is only 15 but in that case b does better it has only 10 right in the severe case also uh b performs better than a because it has a mortality rate of only 20% and not 30% so uh if you look at the denominators right that is when you see that actually there's a huge imbalance in the number of people who are given these treatments but often we are uh, when we when we have access to data right if we don't have access to the subgroups we would see such spurious correlations come up now what is interesting to see is that okay first let's let me go through the notation right so let the outcome which is the mortality be modeled by y right the treatment variable is t condition variable is c so if you look at the total uh, column right it basically the expected value of the outcome given the treatment that's it we are not conditioning over anything the severe condition is when let's say these are these are binary variables so let's say that c equal to 0 says that it's mild and c equal to 1 says that it's severe right so then if we look at these values the percentages change so why does this happen it's because of the imbalance in the number of people who are treated so actually this happens because it depends on what you assume your domain knowledge to be so let's say we have a causal graph okay uh, i'll get to what a causal graph is formally later but let us assume that If you look at the figure on the uh, right, you would see that the condition variable has outgoing edges to T and Y both, right? And the treatment variable has an outgoing edge to the outcome. So, in an ideal situation, we just want to know how the treatment variable T would affect Y, right? That is what we are interested in. So, if we consider this causal graph. where c is the uh, variable at the top which is affecting both t and y then treatment b would be more effective at reducing mortality right if you revisit this table treatment b is better because uh, the condition is the cause of the treatment right so once you know the condition you are deciding which treatment to give the person right but if you look at the overall mort mortalities treatment a seems to be better and this is because c is known to confound the effect of treatment on mortality so i'll explain what confounding is uh, later in the talk but if you look at the other scenario where you say that okay let the treatment be the cause of the condition right now this is not the most natural way to think about this problem but i pose this as an example just so that we understand what is going on here right so if t is a common cause of the condition as well as the outcome then treatment a is more effective why is this because the prescription of treatment b would cause more patients conditions to worsen so let's say that treatment b is scarce right it's not available but you have uh, said that okay this patient needs treatment b only we are not going to give him a for what a reason so if it's scarce its availability is low basically so it's possible that it might take time to actually diagnose the patient with that now when the patient is actually waiting for that treatment to like uh, to happen it's possible that the patient's condition might worsen in that time slot right so this is basically leading the patient's condition to worsen and over here treatment would happen to be a cause of the condition in this case a would be better right so what is important to see here is that based on the assumptions we make about the causal graph in our data the inference we make really matters right because in both these cases both these causes of in the first one we saw that a is better uh, b is better in the second one we saw that a is better so it depends on what really is affecting what in order to make this if we would have only a correlation model we would not be able to make this inference right okay so moving on so yes so causal graphs anyone anyone knows what causal graphs are how they can be okay so i'll go to that okay so uh in past literature causal graphs are 
ट्रेडिशनली डिनोटेड बाय डैग्स डू यू ऑल नो व्हाट डैग्स आर दे आर ए साइक्लिक ग्राफ्स डायरेक्टेड ए साइक्लिक ग्राफ्स राइट बेसिकली अ ग्राफ विच डज नॉट कंटेन अ साइकिल राइट वाई इज दैट बिकॉज यूजली इट्स द नोशन दैट इफ ए कैन कॉज बी एंड बी कॉज सी इट्स नॉट पॉसिबल दैट सी कॉज इज ए दिस इज द एजम्पन बट रिसेंट वर्क इज ऑल्सो शोन दैट देर आर साइक्लिक कॉजेज ऑल्सो फॉर एग्जाम्पल सम एनवायरमेंटल एग्जाम्पल्स राइट सम पॉजिटिव फीडबैक लूप्स इन एनवायरमेंटल साइंसेस सो इफ लेट्स ए पोल्यूशन इज इंक्रीजिंग लीडिंग टू सम रेन क्लाउड्स इंक्रीजिंग एंड देन दैट वुड हैव एन इफेक्ट अगेन ऑन दिस पॉजिटिव री इन्फोर्समेंट विच वुड लीड टू मोर पोल्यूशन अगेन एंड अगेन दिस नॉट अ ग्रेट एग्जाम्पल बट दिस इज अ बेसिक पॉजिटिव फीडबैक लूप सो दीज काइंड ऑफ केसेज आर पॉसिबल बट वी डोंट डेल्व इन टू दैट फॉर नाउ सो वी एज्यूम दैट आर कॉजल ग्राफ्स आर डैग्स फॉर नाउ राइट एंड दीज रिलेशनशिप्स कैन बी एनकोडेड बाय बेजियन नेटवर्क्स राइट सो द बेस एजम्पन इन डिनोटिंग कॉजल ग्राफ्स इज दैट वंस यू हैव अ बेजियन नेटवर्क एवरी वन नोज वॉट बेजियन नेटवर्क इज राइट सो अ बेजियन नेटवर्क इज बेसिकली एनकोडेड एज शोन हियर सो पी ऑफ एक्स so this p of x right here right that's the probability of this node right it's a, a product of all nodes v in v such that this node is given and this denotes the parents of v so if we have a bayesian network like this right so this node right here let's call it a this will be conditionally independent to all other nodes in the graph once its parents uh p and n are given okay this is like an assumption so then once you can conditionally uh give this uh, you, once you can get the marginal distribution for each node then you can work around with causes in a better and more concise manner i'll get to how uh, in in a bit okay so i just showed you that correlation does not imply causation but this you have heard everywhere but the main question is what does right we don't know that yet okay so let's look at the effect of confounders uh, i talked about this in the previous slide right where we saw two different graphs so okay so let's say that the study comes out in the newspaper which says that people who sleep with their shoes on they get headaches in the morning so you get lots of articles saying that oh you should remove your shoes before you go to sleep but that's because the record or the studies are flawed in the sense that they did not look at the confounding factor that the person uh, the people who are more likely to sleep with their shoes on are drunk when they come home right so you are making a wrong assumption here and you are saying that okay if i remove my shoes i won't get a headache i can have as much booze as i want but that's not the case right so this is the confounder which is affecting both the i'll just uh, draw it and show so this is the confounder right that is affecting both the treatment variable and the outcome variable so what we want to isolate our ca causal effect is that this edge right here we want to remove that so that we can say that okay there is no variable that affects my treatment so that when i make a change in this treatment variable i know that whatever changes in y is only because of the change in t right uh, everyone got that okay uh, you have a question anybody okay so this is our confounder this is our treatment variable and this is our outcome variable right and why do we do this again i'll just repeat myself it's so that when we make changes in t we uh, when we observe changes in y should put it like that that when we see changes in y we want to ensure that it's because of the changes in t and not because of the changes in the underlying variables okay that's a simple way to say that and if we are not able to do that right so due to the presence of confounding basically this is what a confounder is that you have some variables which are unaccounted for in your data and they are also affecting the treatment and the outcome 
So you are not able to isolate the effect of the treatment on your outcome, right? So uh, due to the presence of confounding, calculating this treatment effect, treatment effect is difficult, right? And why is that? Because if you want, let's say, let y i denote, y i 1 denote the outcome when I give the patient one medicine and y i 0 denote the case where I don't give him the medicine, right? Then that expected value due to linearity, we can separate these, right? These two can be separated, but they won't be the same as this because over here we are not taking into account the confounders and the counterfactual effect, which is that if uh, if I'm giving somebody Y1, right? I also want to see if there is some change in that uh, 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 in comparison to the case where he himself was not given that uh, medicine. So there's two prongs to this. One is that I give one patient a medicine, right? And the other thing is that what would have happened if I had not given this patient this medicine? So to basically separate out these two, if you have confounders, you cannot, uh, these two will never be equal. So we need to make some assumption about the data or we need to do some sort of uh, testing to see uh, some other testing to see that to, to basically e equalize this guy and this guy. Okay. And why is this? This is because all ca causal quantities are not statistically identifiable. What does this mean? This is like uh, this. Uh, so identifiability means that when you can estimate a causal quantity using a statistical equation, right? Because if you look at causal quantities that are not identifiable, they are basically, you can't calculate them because you don't have access to counterfactual scenarios, okay? So I'll also get that, you get to that in a bit. So this is uh, a meme where I offer you a trade where I get your attention, but maybe you have a headache, but is it because of the talk or is it because of what you had? I don't know. Okay, so we use statistical tests for conditional independence. Why do we want conditional independence? Any guesses? Sorry? Yes, why can we disregard the confounding? So, if it's independent, you're absolutely right. Since it's independent, we can remove the edge between the confounder and the treatment basically if you look at it from a graph point of view right so you are basically separating the two my co so if you are c if your confounders are a set let's say x of covariates right these are called covariates right so if your covariates don't affect t then only can you say that okay my treatment effect is isolated. So let's say you all are a set of patients, right? And I'm a doctor and I want to give you guys some medicine, right? Now, the thing is, since I don't have access to counterfactual scenarios, what is the best thing I can do? I can divide you guys into two groups. One group I give medicine and the other I don't. The problem with this approach is that within these groups, there might be some underlying bias, which I don't know. For example, it's possible that people on this side of uh, uh, the room are older in age than this side. I would not know that while doing sampling. So what I try to do is I close my own eyes and I randomly just pick someone for treatment and some without it. So this is like a random randomized control trial, right? So what I do is uh, I try to do this randomly so that I can separate out the underlying, I can separate out the groups and I can also do it while not creating any underlying bias. Make sense? Okay. Uh, cool. So, okay. Uh, before we jump into that, yeah. So now uh, we use so yeah. So we use statistical tests for conditional independence to test whether there is any kind of relationship between C and T. So by doing such probabilistic invariance tests, we can find out if uh, T is dependent on C or not. And if no dependence is found, that is, if we can see that T and C are basically statistically independent, then 
the faithfulness condition tells us that there is no causal relationship, right? Because that's how our causal graphs are modeled and we can remove this edge. Once we remove this edge, life for us is easy. Okay, after this, making changes to the treatment variable will affect in some changes in the outcome variable and we can say, okay, this is the reason it happened. I'm sure of this, end of story. Because my covariates are staying constant, okay? So, now, uh, this is a little confusing, I know, but basically these are two criteria which we use for in independence testing in a causal graph, okay? So, uh, let's look at backdoor criterion for uh, first, okay? So, let's say you have a causal graph, okay? Uh, I'm just changing this up a bit, right? Now, what backdoor criterion does is, it helps you in finding the backdoor paths, okay? I'll get to what that is in a bit which helps you in isolating this effect. So right now our goal is to only isolate T's effect on Y. That's it. We just want to remove this edge as quickly as possible. So in this case, if you want to look at backdoor criterion, just remove the directions from the edges. Think of this causal graph as a graph without direction. Okay. So all of these edges are undirected. So if I condition, if I don't condition on anything, and if I look at the graph as is, I can find a graph, a, a path via t back to y. Okay. Now, if I condition on x, right? Condition means that when I look at the probability distribution, while taking x as prior knowledge, I can actually block this path right here. So, basically blocking such paths helps me in asserting independence. I, I know it's a little confusing. I'll get to I'll get to how it's done, uh, but this is uh, this is how it's done. So, yeah, okay. So let's say uh, I I don't know how to I don't have a good big example in mind, but let's say I have a big causal graph, right? And basically, you do see that if I remove the direction of the edges from the causal graph, then it's just a correlation graph, right? Because if two guys are connected, then they're correlated. That's it. We don't claim anything else. So. If you are able to go from the treatment variable to the outcome variable through another path, right? Then that means that, okay, they are also correlated, right? Because through some other variable, uh, it's showing some effect which you want to nullify. So by conditioning on, so let's say it's some, if you have a situation like this, I think uh, this would suffice as an example, right? This is Y, right? And you have X1. And let's say you have x2, x3, okay? All of these are in the uh, model like this, okay? Now, if you condition on x1, x2, and x3, then you're blocking this path. I'll change the color, wait. Uh, so this is one path, right? Of co uh, uh, correlation wise, this is the second path. This is the third path. Apart from the path, that is the actual causal effect, which we want to measure. This is the actual causal effect. Causal effect, which we want to isolate, right? So now, if we condition on this node, this node, and this node, we are taking it as given information. So then it won't show up in correlation. Okay? So once we have identified all such nodes, so the backdoor criterion helps us in identifying all such nodes on which if we condition, then we'll be able to isolate this causal effect. Is it clear? Please feel free to stop me and ask questions, okay? Uh, yeah. Sorry? Yeah, okay. It's basically the, so right now you have a pro joint probability distribution, right? P of X, T, and all those variables and they give you this outcome probability, right? Uh, or expected value of Y. Now, if you condition on these, so let's say if you do this P of T given X1, X2, X3, this is the conditioning I'm talking about. So if you condition on these variables, you are actually blocking those paths from a structural point of view. That's it. And if you do this, right, then you'll get your independence also because we are doing an invariance test. 
what does invariance mean that even if i yeah what invariance means is that if these are conditionally independent then if i make changes in if i make changes to t y will be uh, y will be invariant to all other changes except for the ones which i do in t that kind of a thing uh, am i clear or no yeah. okay maybe i can explain it to you later on and for now i'll just go ahead with the definition and if you have a question again just please stop me okay uh, so basically this backdoor criterion says that given an ordered pair of variables x and y in a directed acyclic graph g right of variable z so we are already down to z we have a set x of covariates we don't need to condition on all of these sets because then we would be expecting too much domain knowledge okay i'll get to that uh, i'll get to that later let's just say that there's a set x okay and we want to find the minimal set z on which we can condition to isolate t causing y okay so to find this subset z is our goal so backdoor criterion is basically says that so if no node in z is a descendant of x and z blocks every path between x and y that contains an arrow into x then that path is called a backdoor path okay this the definition is involved okay it takes some time to understand but let's just assume that uh you basically are finding the backdoor path to just look at all the spurious correlations that are happening in your correlation graph okay and what d separation does is so once you have all these backdoor paths right you know that okay these are these many correlation paths that exist now i want to block them so you block them using this condition which is d separation so what d separation says is that for any variables v1 and v2 in w okay w is a set of vertices and a set v in w v1 and v2 are d separated by v in g if v blocks every path between v1 and v2 in g so it's a safe assumption to say that if two nodes are d separated then they are independent okay d is it's not a it's it just it's just called d separation it does not have any meaning it's not a value or anything okay it's just called d separation so what we need to see is that these two things right these two big definitions they are only saying this that once i'm done with this once i have the variables that are d separated i can say that okay they are independent in our causal graph so you know which set to condition on only to get the t and y that's it end of story okay so let's move on for now okay so by doing this you are actually intervening on this entire set because now i'm making i'm fixing a few things and i'm changing the other things right so this is actually defined by defined as do calculus what do calculus is that when i intervene on a variable right let's say i don't have the x to t edge right let's say it's gone then if i intervene on t i'm basically intervening on t by saying that okay right now the treatment is equal to 0 that means i'm not giving the medicine then i decide to give it so then there's some change in y so i intervened on the variable t right and i saw a change in y so that means that i'm doing something to t basically and uh, that's not the best way of looking at it because right now you're conditioning not over t but you're conditioning over the set of covariates so if you basically if you fix x is right i i i'll reframe myself okay i, I was not clear there uh, if i let's say if i fix all the x's let's say we have three columns x1 x2 and x3 right and two more columns which is t and y so now i've fixed all x's it's just cemented t i can change between 0 and 1 and accordingly y will change right so by doing this i am actually intervening on the set of x so that is what do x denotes that we are given that it is fixed we are intervening on it no change and then if you look at the probability of y and z z is because we need that set which we got on which we need to condition right which is a subset of the original x is okay so then that probability would be equal to probability of y z and x given x divided by only those uh only taking z as the given part 
So you don't need to condition on the entire set X. Uh, okay, Z is basically a subset of X on which if you condition, then you are isolating the, yeah, you're de-separating, perfect. So the set of, the set Z can be equal to X. It can, but it need not be. Okay. Uh, I'll just move on for now. Okay. And I'll tell you how these are modeled. I think if I give an example, it'll be better. Okay. And maybe we can revisit this uh, later. Okay. So basically now these models are, they're actually viewed or the, they are encoded in Bayesian networks, but they can be understood using structural equation models. Okay. So structural equation models are basically those models that explain relationships between these measured variables and latent variables. Okay. That's terminology, but what latent variable means is basically confounders. Okay. It's the same meaning. So, and relationship between those latent variables. So usually this is like a very, very big assumption that we know everything about, we have global knowledge that, okay, this is the hidden confounder, not connected, it relates this way to another hidden confounder. No, we are not, it's like a very, very elaborate relationship, which we often don't have access to in our, uh, in, in our data. Okay. But basically structural equation models use this assumption that, you know, everything you have global knowledge, and then they make this equation to model your causal effect. Uh, yeah. And, uh, it's actually impossible to take care of all, all latent variables in your data because let's say that you have data about this clinical trials, right? That I have these two groups, I'm giving medicine, one I'm not. The movement of the sun, the time of the day, all of that is also a variable that might affect our data. But to record all such things, right? What is the flow of the river Sabarmati right now when I'm giving this guy this medicine? Right, that is also a latent variable, but it might not be relevant to our case. So hence we choose to ignore it, but that's because of our domain knowledge, right? So what these structural equation models assume, right? Is that you have perfect knowledge about everything, right? Okay. So structural equation models are for statistical quantities. So like, likewise, they model it to structural causal models, right, which consist of a set of endogenous and a set of exogenous variables connected by a set of functions f that determine the values of the variables in v based on the valuables of the variables in u. Okay. So I'll explain this. Okay. So firstly, you have a structural causal model SCM, right, that consists of a set of endogenous. What does endogenous mean is the variables in our data, which we see in, uh, in front of us. Okay. And exogenous variables are those which are, of, which might be affecting our data, but we don't know about them. So we have, we don't have them recorded in our data set, but they might be affecting our variables. Okay. We don't know the, the hidden latent variables. Okay. And, uh, they are connected by some functions F, which are known. Okay. So even though we don't know exactly what those variables are, there might be a set of functions through which we can relate them. Okay. And those determine the values of the variables in V. What was V? V was the set of endogenous variables based on the values of the variables in U. Right. This is like a simple thing, which says that we don't know what these U variables are exactly, but we have some functions which can tell us that, okay, this is the effect. Of, then we are good to go because we are assuming global knowledge. So we are just acknowledging the fact that, okay, we have recorded information about V, but we don't have recorded information about U, but we know about how U affects V. So we are good to go. That's it. That is all. There's nothing new. Okay. So if we think of a DAG as representing the flow of information or the flow of the cause, right? Then the variables U are the inputs to the system. While the variable V, uh, variables V are the nodes where that information is processed basically. Okay. This is a, not a great way of saying it. But I think you know that now, basically your set of covariates, entire set of covariates would be made up of U and V. If U and V are two mutually exclusive sets and they would add up to make your covariates. Okay. So, uh, the idea of autonomy and invariance, right, which we talked about 
is deeply ingrained in the concept of structural equation models or SCMs. They are basically the same thing. It is that SCMs for causal effects are SCMs. Okay. And we prefer this Latin term because the term SCM has been used in a number of contexts where the structural assignments are used as algebraic equations also rather than assignments. So it is just a way of saying that we prefer to use SCM. We prefer to use SCM instead of SEM just because uh, it is a causal context. Okay, that is it. Okay, so now I come to where this all comes together. Okay, it is called semi Markov models, and these are causal graphs in which you can simply encode your information about un underlying variables and your recorded variables. So, a semi Markovian causal model M is a tuple. Okay. V, V is the set of endogenous, the ones which you can see is the set of observed variables. Okay, so, so your X, right, it can be some set of uh, observed variables O1, O2, you know what X is, right? X is the set of covariates, right, the confounders, okay, so O1, O2, O3 and let us say go to ON. And then X also contains uh, unobserved variables U1, U2, U3 up to Um. Okay. So we have information, let us say we have a tabular data set, then we have all information about O1 to On. Correct? Okay. And then we have some M variables which we do not have in our data which are also affecting the same thing. So V is the set of such observed variables, right? And U is the set of unobserved features, right? So both of these X, O, they denote it as X, O, this paper denotes it as X, O and X, U, right? So these add up to the entire set. So if you look at the definition of U, it's actually V minus W, uh, W minus V, where W is the entire set of vertices, okay? Cool. And G is the diag over the set of vertices W such that each member in U has no parents and at most two children. Okay. So, how do I explain this? Uh, okay. So, basically we have a DAG, right? Which look, tells us all the causal relationships in our data set. Now, uh, yeah. So, at most two is only because if it is affecting more than that, then you are uh, your effect is okay. Just one second, okay. <laughs> okay, I, I don't remember right now. That's a really good question. I'll look it up, okay. Uh, why two children? Okay, but yeah, I'll, I'll skip that for now. Please remind me to get back to you. Okay, and then we have this uh, encoding of the parent variables for each and every child. So if, when we looked at Bayesian networks, right, the, uh, we saw that each and every node in the causal graph can be encoded by its parents, yeah. right? You remember that? So once you uh, condition over the parents, it will be independent to all of the nodes. Okay, so this is basically the joint distribution of a node given its observed parents and unobserved parents. Okay, and PU is basically the prior joint distribution of the unobserved variables. Okay, so, uh, so Poojan, I still, I, I am not able to recall the answer to your question, but at least I should raise this here that in a semi Markovian model, Unobserved variables with only one or no children are omitted. Why is that? Maybe your answer would also lie within that. So, unobserved variables with no children are omitted. Yes, because they do not affect our causal graph in any way. We do not want. The flow of Sabarmati river, we are not interested in. Fine, let it flow. We do not care. We, it does not affect uh, how I should give a treatment to a patient. Okay. So, that is why we remove that. One variable, why do we do that? Because if it is causally affected, affecting only one node, then that node itself is taking in all the information that is required from the causal effect coming from the confounder. Oh, 
right? So we remove that. But yeah, exactly. We can merge them together. Exactly, it's redundant. Perfect. We can merge it. Yeah, so I'm not able to think of what it might help in because if it's still a confounder and if it's affecting more than two things, I don't see why that would be a problem. Or maybe it's an assumption just so that you can calculate backdoor criteria easily. But I, I, I need to check up on that. I'm not sure of that. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, very sorry for that. But so do you guys uh, understand what this is entailing? Right? Okay. Uh, okay, so. Apparently this doesn't work for you guys since you got it already, but I'll give you guys an example, right? Uh, this is our semi-Markovian model. Okay. So the variables uh, named with U and some subscript I, right? They are the latent variables. They are the unobserved variables and T is the treatment. Why is the outcome? This is an unobserved variable, unobserved variable, unobserved variable, and unobserved variable. So, oh, I think I uh, just give it to me. I think the reason there are not more than two children is that uh, because then the uh, then isolating the causal effect will become a challenge. I think because if it has more than two. Yeah, sure. Okay, we will get to that later. I'll just get done with all my material and we can talk after this, right? So, yeah, so this is how it's encoded, and then you can simply show it like this, right? That, uh, your U1 basically can be treated. So we treat all the uh, confounder edges as a bi-directed edge. That's just how it's shown, just to simplify things, right? So we know that, okay, something fishy is happening in between here, 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 and here. Okay, this is just, this is just a way of seeing it. And this is where you are allowed to have such exogenous variables that you don't have effect, uh, that you don't have access to. Okay, okay. So, this is basically the Perlian framework of causal inference, which was developed by the renowned computer scientist uh, Julia Pearl. And assuming that this entire causal graph, right, this global knowledge is available is a very strong assumption. That we know everything about everything and then we can infer the cause easily, right? That's a very, very strong assumption. And it's often difficult to follow this in the data centric process. Because it, data sets, if, it, if they are uh, large with lots of features, then it's often tough to make inferences because finding patterns is using this informed causal graph is tough, right? Because then you would have a Bayesian network. So there are uh, super exponi exponential probability distributions that you individually have to deal with, right? So it's just not as neat. So then we come to the, uh, yeah. So the Perlian framework commonly assumes structural knowledge, which is provided by an expert. So if I go to a doctor and I tell him, okay, is the condition the cause of the treatment or is it the treatment that causes the condition? He'll, uh, that doctor, he or she will be easily able to tell me that, okay, this is the cause. And according to that, I can model. So that is what the Perlian, frameworks ne Perlian framework needs to assume, right? And so this framework commonly assumes structural knowledge in the form of DAGs and it provides graphical criteria like we saw, like de-separation and backdoor criteria, right, backdoor paths to identify what is called as the valid adjustment set. So what is a valid adjustment set? That is the set Z, okay. The set Z is called a valid adjustment set, which is a subset of the set of covariates. So that, suppose I'm given a causal graph, right? Let's uh, revisit that example. Sorry for bringing it up again and again. Right. In this case, if I condition on x1, x2 and x3, right, only then am I blocking all the backdoor paths. But suppose I have another variable x4, right, which is not connected to t, it goes somewhere else, let's say. Okay. So I do not need to condition on that if it does not contain a path to 
to y, right? So I just need that minimal set of x i's within the entire set x to condition on so that I can isolate my causal effect. So this minimal set is basically the set z. And these will, so as I said, these valid adjustment sets are a minimal subset, oops, z of the covariates x, right? And if we condition on this set z, then the causal effect t to y can be isolated and we can directly calculate the treatment. Okay, so this is what the Perlian frame looks like. Now let's have a change of form, right? Now we look at potential outcomes framework. This is extremely common in the uh, in, in machine learning literature, um, how well am I doing on this? Okay. So, okay. So, what potential outcomes does is, it looks at two scenarios again. If you take a pill and you feel fine, you are good to go. If you don't take a pill and you don't feel fine, then you are sure that okay, then the pill has an effect. If I am feeling happy even after I took the pill, if, even if I don't take the pill, then it does not have any effect on me, right? So this is a potential outcomes framework. Choose between these guys. Okay. So this is what is, so this framework is built on the ignorability assumption. What ignorability assumption says is that I have access to whatever data I have access to is the global knowledge. I don't, I don't have any exogenous variables. I don't have any underlying variables like you which we saw in the Perlian framework. So this assumption just says that the two potential outcomes that we can get, if, if we look at this, right, Y0 and Y1, Y0 is the outcome if we don't give that patient the medicine, and Y1 is the same outcome, is the outcome of that same guy if we give him the medicine. That will be independent of the treatment if the entire set of X is given. This is called the ignorability assumption. And over here, since there is no presence of any conf uh, confounding variable or anything, just take it at its face value and the set Z, the subset Z which we talked about before does not exist. It's just X is equal to Z in this case. Yeah, you just assume. And this, why this framework is really popular in machine learning is that you have features, right? You just take your loss function you learn over these set of features, you don't have anything else to worry about. So it's like you're learning two different distributions. One distribution would be your probability distribution on what the patient's uh, outcomes were when you gave them the treatment versus what it was when you didn't give them the treatment. That's it. It's just two different distributions and you're just learning a regular function like regression or classifier based. Okay. So that's the reason machine learning literature mostly contains usage of this ignorability assumption and hence the potential outcomes framework. Yeah, so, right, right. <coughs> so, uh, then, so in this case also we have the same uh, observational data xi, wi, yi, right. Each patient i has let's say features blood sugar level and weight, right. These are in the d dimensional space, d features. Right? This is a feature space basically. Two potential outcomes. Are you feeling fatigued or not? Right? And then treatment assignment. Should I give this guy a glucon D or not? Okay? And that can be entailed like this. So, now we want to estimate the causal effect. But again, we don't have access to counterfactual data. So, our causal uh, equation becomes simply this. Which is just yi which is equal to wi yi 1 right and 1 minus wi into yi 0 does any everyone see why that is because wi if i choose it to be 1 then this guy will be 0 right so then yi 1 that okay when i give this treatment because we won't have we won't have access where these two guys are different is what i was saying my bad Exactly. So we don't have access to the counterfactual scenarios. And when you take an expected value over your entire groups, you can find the total causal effect. Okay. So now I look at the metric average treatment effect. So when you have some causal models, you want to evaluate how well they work. Then instead of looking at F1 score and 
uh, or MSC errors in case of regression and class, uh, classifier and all, you, you should rather look at what the average treatment effect is and if you have access to ground truths, then you know what the causal effect would be. So then you should try and learn accordingly. So this is like, so if you have one individual, you give them treatment or you don't give them, that's the difference between these two guys, right? That's the individual treatment effect. But since I don't have access to counterfactuals, I do randomly assigned control and treatment groups. And then I look at these observed outcomes. And then I take the average over these guys. And then I get the average uh, treatment effect. And if I look at only the treated group, uh, uh, then I can get the AT, T, average treatment effect on the treated group. That's it. Okay. So this framework is relatively simple to work with. This framework, is, uh, this framework is more famous amongst machine learning scientists while the former one is better appreciated by statisticians, naturally, right? So assuming ignorability in all uses can be limiting and both frameworks hence come with a very strong set of assumptions, right? So maybe it would be interesting to find some bridge between the two so that you don't require the entire causal graph also. And you don't even need to assume strong ignorability. You can get the set Z and condition only on those sets to come to a middle ground. Okay. This framework, uh, the framework to be used can however be determined by the type of data. So that's where domain knowledge comes in and the inference or findings that need to be performed. Okay. So uh, I'll speed up my speed and uh, I'll speed up my discourse now because uh, there are two topics remaining. So we have looked at these two frameworks and now we can start looking at their applications. So pertaining to these two schools of thoughts, there are two intuitive directions to proceed now. One is using graphs to learn uh, causal effects and the other is using, uh, using causal effects to understand networks as we saw uh, in our previous talks in this school, right? So for, I'll quickly go through this graphs in causal discovery, right? So when you have observational data, looking at the data is, it's, it's often tough to see what the causal effect between these variables would be. So there are many, many methods which are, uh, which learn the causal graph from this observational data, right? It is called structure learning. Okay. And this is a contemporary area. Uh, and uh, it's basically learning of such causal graphs from observational data. In the simplest. Did you also say that these graphs, the causal structure has to be given by a domain expert? Yeah. Yeah, but then how am I learning the causal graph? Oh, yeah. So, and if you conditionally, uh, uh, so if you look at invariance tests and then you calculate all backdoor paths with global knowledge, yeah. then you can isolate the causal effect, right? Regardless. Still have, uh, taking the strong ignorability. Yeah, when I said domain experts, right, that's for the ground truth. So that ground truth is not known in that sense, right? You need some, some person from the field to tell you, okay, this is how it looks like basically. But in most use cases, you yourself have some sort of an idea. So you can evaluate those graphs like that or using the adjacency matrix or something like that. So it's just that for the access to ground truths, you would have to have manually annotated data. Did I answer your question? Yeah, so Manav, uh, basically, so uh, you have, in this case where uh, you don't have a domain expert, which is basically doing strong vulnerability and uh, inferring based on conditional probability. Right, right, yeah, yeah, that, that's, yeah. Okay, so in the simplest case, a Bayesian network is specified by an expert and is then used to perform inference. You're done. You just have the causal graph and you're done. In other co applications, the task of defining the network is too complex for humans. Let's say you have too many variables, right? Then making a DAG from that is often tough. So in many cases, the network structure and parameters of the local distributions must be learned from data, right? So causal structure learning represents an unsupervised learning process. It's unsupervised. So now you don't have access to the ground truth, right? That can be broadly classified into combinatorial optimization and continuous optimization, okay? So what combinatorial optimization does is your uh, algorithm search for a Boolean valued or a discrete valued adjacency matrix. Boolean because it's not weighted and uh, discrete valued means that it's a weighted matrix. So your causal effect is also, you lo you're looking at the magnitude of the causal effect, right? So, and it captures the presence and absence of edges. And then you can run 
uh, algorithms to basically see that okay this is what it looks like from the data and you're done there's no ground truth because it's unsupervised and a more recent approach uh, sorry there's no label uh, you have the ground truth through, through do domain experts, right? A more recent approach introduces the idea of continuous optimization that uses a real valued adjacency matrix which can be tackled by optimizers with an acyclicity constraint. So this is a very, very cool approach where now you don't need to look at this super exponential space of DAGs and search that, okay, is this DAG entailing my probability distribution the best or is it this one? No, you don't have to worry about that. You have a continuous optimization thing where if you just run it, you get the best uh, uh, maximal solution and you're done. However, this is a, an NP-hard problem. So this, all of these are heuristic methods. Yeah. Okay. So this is a paper which set the tone for continuous uh, uh, optimization for structural learning. It's by these four uh, authors who were at uh, Carnegie Mellon. Uh, this paper is, I think, from 2018. You should really go and check it out. It's really cool. So this is uh, where they introduce, uh, they remove, as you can see, the resulting problem can be efficiently uh, solved by standard numerical algorithms and it avoids the com combinatorial constraint entirely. How do they do this? They just ensure the acyclicity constraint in their adjacency matrix. So uh, they take the trace of the matrix and they exponentiate it and then uh, they just know that the trace should be zero because that ca counts the number of paths in your graph. That's it. Okay. So there are a lot of other methods based on that. And uh, DAG, so the, this original paper is called DAG no tears, DAG with no tears. Actually, oops. Uh, so all these other methods learn this through neural networks. They learn each and every edge and the adjacency matrix through uh, neural lag learning, that's what it's called, okay? So, yeah, then we have types of structure learning. One is constraint based. So these algorithms perform a series of marginal and conditional independence tests to identify undirected edges between variables and orientate some of those edges. So this basically helps you find the causal graph, right? And score based where these algorithms rely only on heuristic search techniques, right? And there are also hybrid techniques which map the two. I'll uh, skip over a little because uh, time is running out. So this is the last uh, topic of my talk, which talks about causal inference in social networks, right? So as we saw, experiments are a useful method to identify and estimate causal network effects, right? For example, the uh, effect of an intervention for one individual on outcomes of others, magnified or dis diffused by social ties. So you t you saw about, you as Sitabra said to right, this diffusion in your... Uh, uh, in your social networks and as uh, Amit sir talked about uh, uh, the flowing of the fluid, right, basically to your neighbors. So if I stop, uh, if I look at causal effects from a meta view on the social networks, does it affect? So if I, for example, there's a whole community staying in a city, let's say in Ahmedabad, right, and I stop sending water to one of those areas it would somehow it would affect neighboring communities and all right you would gradually see on a temporal graph you would see how they are getting affected and all right so i am intervening on that area of the graph or the social network and that is leading to other consequences right so such kind of causal effects can be studied for social network data right or uh, let's say cambridge uh, analytica or whatever right what they did was that they looked at such module like they looked at modules in the graph right communities in the graph and then they sent them targeted ads because they had their causal model ready that okay if i look at let's say pujan and he's influential in his circle if i show him this targeted ad it's very pos it's possible that he'll send it to others so this is actually there is it's causal inspired it's causality inspired but it's not directly modeled right if you directly model this then it's like a proper cause effect social network analysis right okay so the effects of interventions can be roughly divided into network effects and effects on networks as i just said right network effects concern how an intervention on one person on pujan may affect not only uh, his or her own outcome but also the outcome of let's say mano prakash and sherin right but also the outcomes of uh, uh, yeah and the effects on networks 
concern how an intervention may alter the structure of the network itself. So if I, uh, if uh, let's say water shortage, if I deliberately do a water shortage in one part of Ahmedabad, maybe those people will shift and stay, go to stay elsewhere, right? That would affect the structure of the network. It's a very bad example, but it would uh, affect this structure. And sometimes understanding how the structure changes is important, right? So uh, there are actually a lot of papers on this also. So there is one paper which looks at estimating causal effects and they look at how this flow goes, right? They encode how the diffusion process occurs across this. And similarly, there are enough and interestingly, these are all sociological research papers. So you can see a lot of applications in clinical psychology and sociology, right? And estimating average causal under interference between units. So between communities, you can look at how differently they interact after you do an intervention. And spillover effects is the term I was trying to remember that once you affect one person, one community, how do those effects spill over on their neighboring communities in the graph? So, uh, yeah. And uh, propagation history ranking in social networks. So this would also be an interesting uh, thing to look at. Uh, so the conclusion uh, is that the notion of causal inference and discovery is definitely slowly creeping up in network science. Uh, and the strength of causal reasoning for network, it's, it seems to be very seamless, right? It's still a very baby field, right? Because till now, whoever did some causal analysis on social networks is, they already know what to expect when before they do their experiments, right? So unlike machine learning, where they now want causal informed models to tell them what is causing what in order to uh, predict better. But in this case, it's still relatively young. And causal uh, reasoning isn't always easy to integrate with real world models, but does help in abstraction of the model itself. So uh, this, uh, with this, I come to the end of my talk. Uh, thank you very much for your patience.